Uh, good evening. Thank you for coming out. My name is Matt Rowe. I'm with the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, New Orleans District Public Affairs Office. And I'd like to thank everybody for coming out and uh, joining us this evening to talk about the South Central Coast Study. Uh, you'll be hearing from our team members, uh, Carrie, Carla, and Joe. If you could go around and raise your hands real quick so people know who you are. And then we've also got Sarah Bradley and uh, Stacy from the Corps of Engineers here as well if you have any questions. The main focus of tonight is to uh, talk to you, the, you all and uh, get your ideas and feedback and find uh, look for any gaps in the information we're looking uh, at and uh, look for anything that we may not know. Uh, we're early in the process right now and we're really trying to, to look for information and gather facts. Uh, I'd like to uh, recognize uh, Michael Eby from Senator Cassidy's office. Thank you for joining us and members of the Iberia uh, Parish Council who are here tonight. And uh, without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Carrie. So thank you. Welcome, every. Can you hear me? Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, some of you had said that you received notice just as of yesterday. So thank you again for coming out. So first, we want to talk a little bit about um, the main purpose of this meeting is for environmental scoping and we highly encourage public participation and public comment throughout this three-year study process and a lot of people what is NEPA well NEPA right here is a part of the environmental review process with the study because due to the significant um, resources in our um, three parish study area caused the need for an EIS, which is environmental impact statement. And again, you have the time, the opportunity now tonight to express comments, concerns. We have plenty of note cards, comment cards on the table and also in the back where you signed in. Um, take some with you, pass them out to coworkers, neighbors, any partnership that you have that may express an interest in our um, study area. Um, the notice of intent, which is part of the EIS process, was uh, published in the Federal Register on April 2nd of this year. And normally there's a 45 45 day comment period, but we are keeping the comment period open. We want your comments. So it's gonna be a continuous um, process throughout the study. Talk a little bit about the authorization. The South Central Coast Feasibility Study was authorized under the HR docket 2767, the 20th of September, 2006. In 2018, the BBA, also known as the Bipartisan Budget Act, gave us the funding to fund the study. This study is also known as a three by three, by three. What does that mean, you're probably wondering. Well, we have $3 million to complete the study in a three year period. And it's 100% federally funded. This slide gives you um, a quick snapshot of our study area which includes three parishes in the southern portion of Louisiana, the parishes of Iberia, St. Martin, and St. Mary's. Oh, and just one thing, the, the project area is outlined in purple. Okay, so we have several goals. Get to my notes. Several goals for the study. Number one objective, reduce risk to life uh, from hurricanes. Our number one initiative, let me say, for the study is protecting this area from, hor um, from hurricanes and storm surge, number one. Flooding, riverine is secondary. Um, another objective is to reduce economic loss and impact and also to protect our evacuation routes, reduce risk to the main, which is the main route going through our study area is Highway 90. So we're also looking at alternatives to definitely protect that area. Um, and I got, um, number two, goal two, maintain and sustain the natural ecosystem from flood damages, minimize degradation to vulnerable coastal habitat and wetland areas increase sustainability of existing natural flood barriers such as wetlands. 
All right. We have, throughout this whole study, we are um, constantly coordinating and collaborating with various federal and non-federal agencies. This is just a few of our key partners. Um, CPRA is our non-federal sponsor, which is the Louisiana Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority. Um, and then as you see some, some ever, other permitting agencies listed, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and also some state um, departments. And we have one um, main tri tribal coordination, um, Chittimacha, okay, <laughs> I got it right, tribe of Louisiana. And um, we have continuous communication uh, with them throughout the whole study to date. Um, I am, again, Carrie Schott, project manager. So my main focus is schedule, budget, keeping everyone on track. Um, this is a snapshot of where we were, where we, where we are, and where we're going. We started, we kicked off the study in November 2018. And right now, as you see, we are here. Um, we are developing alternatives. And by fall, winter, we are going to narrow them down and have a t tentatively selected plan, also known as TSP. Um, and the three-year process. At the end, September 2021, we are going to have a final report. It's called a final uh, report to the chief. And that is going to go to headquarters and be approved um, by headquarters. And also, um, once it's approved there, it will go to con Congress for, um, for consideration for future funding. And with that said, um, again, I would, I would just want to recognize, since we went so fast earlier, but some key members of our project delivery team, um, our lead planner, Carla Sparks, right there, the senior project ma manager, Sarah Bradley, and we also have hydraulics and hydrology, Stacy Frost, our H&H, &H, and our environmental expert, Joe Jordan. So I just wanted to recognize them. I'm gonna turn it over to Carla Sparks. She is going to discuss um, our, our, the alternatives. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm a little shorter. Is this, can you hear me okay? All right. Um, so this is one of the things I did want to point out in the three-year process um, this is the second time we've been out for public comment we will come back after we have a, re a recommended plan uh, in the approximately the December time frame of this year uh, and then you'll get to comment on the recommended plan again so you'll see us again um, but for now we wanted to just give you an update on some of the features and measures that we've been considering where we are in the process and the alternatives that we've developed thus far um, so with the core, we have a, a six-step planning process. The first step is identifying problems and opportunities. The second step is identifying inventory and forecast, or what's otherwise known as existing conditions. And then you have to forecast out those existing conditions 50 years into the future. And I'll talk a little bit more about why and how that's used in the planning process. Um, the third step then is formulating alternative plans and then evaluating the effects of those alternative plans. So we're right now kind of between steps three and four. Ultimately, before we come back in December, we'll have to compare those alternative plans and make the recommended, make a selection on a recommended plan. So the first step, problems and opportunities. When we came out in November, we gathered information from folks uh, at, at actually in the same place about what are the problems and opportunities we are seeing in the study area. And what we heard from you guys was that storm surge and rivering flooding in the area is a reoccurring problem that's uh, causing economic damages. There is uh, several existing levees in the study area. Those existing levees, uh, were, which were former federal projects, uh, although they were designed for riverine flooding and are providing riverine flooding protection, they are not designed for the 1% hurricane storm surge protection. Um, so that's also a problem in the project area. We do also have several environmental challenges um, related to land loss, coastal areas, and sea level rise that are occurring and will certainly affect um, our study area as we move forward. In terms of project opportunities, of course, the number one priority for the Corps is public safety. Um, 
Additionally, we plan to our project will hopefully reduce flood damages, risk to land prop and property um, through either structural or non-structural solutions. Uh, there's an opportunity here to leverage the local, state, and federal efforts to manage those flood risks. So it's really important. I'm very glad to see the levy, levy and drainage districts here tonight um, and also working with our state partners and taking into account the master plan that they developed and put a lot of work into. Um, we're incorporating all those different things into our study. We would like to reduce flood risk to commodities and critical infrastructure that are within the project area. Uh, and reduce risk to that key evacuation route that Carrie was talking about, the Highway 90 corridor. Um, also, uh, not a primary objective of our, our study, but uh, certainly a secondary one, uh, stem the loss of coastal land and wetland marshes. So since November, our study team has been working uh, on developing that existing conditions and really what that existing conditions is is helping us do is what are what are the exi the conditions on the ground um, as it relates to hydrology uh, cultural resources um, uh, uh, endangered species what are all where are all those things at in the study area and uh, how are they influencing what we may uh, select or use as a measure to reduce flood risk in the area and this is so this is just one example of the data that this team has been analyzing and what you can see here is this is a map showing storm surge existing conditions storm surge um, water elevations and I guess one thing to note is these blue lines here are those existing levees around Morgan City area uh, they although they are not designed for the 1% hurricane storm surge they are pro providing some protection level against the storm surge as you can see over here this water is certainly going up further and is um, uh, deeper um, and like I said, this is just existing conditions. So this isn't taking into account uh, relative sea level rise and a 50-year forecast. Uh, so this would, uh, and I'll show, there's actually maps we have that we can talk about later um, after the presentation that show what our forecasted depth would be in this area. Another element that we've been considering during the inventory and forecasting and description of uh, existing conditions. So we've, um, Certainly we're focusing on the lower part of Iberia, St. Martin, and St. Uh, Mary parishes in terms of those measures that we'll put on the ground. Uh, so like down here is, and, and to the w west here is where most of our action measures will be uh, focused. But I wanna make sh assure you that we understand that to understand what the problems and opportunities are here, we have to take a broader view. So. Although the study area and the implementation area is limited to those three parishes, we are looking at the watershed level to understand what, what is going on at the greater watershed level that's influencing what the challenges are here in these three parishes. And this is just a closer view of those existing flood risk management structures that we'll be considering um, with, for this study. On the economic side for trying to understand the problems and opportunities and existing conditions within the study area, here on the, on the left you can see this is existing conditions. So the number of structures here down are shown um, in the zero to three feet water depth range. We have about 1,500 structures. Three to eight feet, about 8,000 structures. Greater than eight feet, about 3,700 with a total of 50,000 structures. So that's what we have it being impacted under existing conditions. Under our future without project conditions, we have um, 2,400 uh, properties being inundated three to eight feet, 18,000 structures being in inundated greater than eight feet with the same total number of structures. So that's kind of the, um, what the team has been focusing on since November is collection and, and assessment of this type of data. Now as we move through the study, and every study has constraints, um, some of them are kind of universal constraints, like we, ha we have to follow state laws, federal laws, that kind of thing, but there's uh, certainly other constraints that I just, a few of them I want to point out. Um, we, through this study, will have to minimize the transfer of flood risk, and if we do transfer flood risk, we'll have to disclose that to the public. Um, we'll have to minimize coastal marsh 
loss and if and avoid coastal marsh impacts to the extent practicable. If we cannot do that, we'll have to mitigate. Um, we'll certainly uh, try to avoid impacts to any critical infrastructures. Um, we'll have to avoid impacts to the GIWW. Um, yeah, so, th oh, and another key uh, constraint for this project is the appropriation authority does not allow us to formulate for ecosystem restoration. Um, so, uh, like marsh restoration and that kind of thing, we can consider that as part of a, a feature or a measure that to reduce uh, cor uh, coastal storm surge uh, or, or riverine flooding, but that has to be justified under our, uh, what they call our national economic uh, development uh, program. So as part of every project that the core feasibility study that the core looks at has to have what they call a no action alternative. That no action alternative just describes if we do if the core does nothing, what is the most likely future of within that study area? And uh, so a few key resources I like to point out for our forecasting of the no action alternative is we are anticipating an increased flood risk due to sea level rise and increased storm surges. We're expecting an increased storm, storm damages as a result of increased frequency and intensity of storms in the study area. Uh, subsidence is expected to continue at the current rate um, with coastal erosion continuing. Damages would likely increase and have it ad exist additional saltwater intrusion. Um, However, the study area is pretty complex because right around the Wax Lake outlet, we do have a delta forming uh, in that area. So while well, most of the study area is actually losing land and uh, you do have one small spot that is actually gaining. So the no action alternative uh, ends up serv serving as the baseline uh, that we compare all of our alternatives to. So this really sets the projection that we're, uh, where we're allowed to claim benefits and, and justify our different alternatives. So next I wanna get into what are those different measures that are, we're currently considering? And, and one of the key things that we might like to hear from you guys tonight is there, is there something else that we should consider um, that we, you haven't seen up here yet tonight? So we're looking at uh, multiple what we would call comprehensive levee systems that go across the entire uh, study area. So they would uh, kind of, whoop, sorry, wrong button. They would kind of key into the existing uh, levees over here on the eastern edge of the boundary and one of the uh, conceptual uh, layouts is, is actually this based on the uh, CPRA's master plan and that's shown in green here. So this comprehensive levee system would include, uh, would, uh, not shown here, would have to have some sluice gates, uh, multiple pumps, um, uh, and it would be like an extensive levee system. The red area here is the second alignment that we're assessing. It's a little bit further north, and the reason for that is the further north you go, generally you won't have to go as build the levee as high and that can make, uh, make it a little bit cheaper. Um, so we're looking at essentially an offset of the I-90 corridor to the southern edge here. That would also need to have uh, pumps and sluice gates at key canals. The other part, structural element of our, our levee system is the, the existing levees over on this side. As I mentioned previously, these were, these were designed for riverine flooding. Um, they're part of MRNT system. They are not, although providing some hurricane benefits, they are not to the 1% uh, hurricane storm protection. So uh, one of the other measures that we are evaluating is raising these levees to meet the 1%. And it would include these levees here within the study area. So outside of no, uh, structural measures, we're also looking at non-structural measures. And so a non-structural measure is uh, something that does not modify or restrict the natural flood. Um, and there's some benefits to the non-structural measures. Um, there's typically minimal uh, operational maintenance costs. Uh, they certainly over the long term, they reduce flood risk uh, and reduce those economic damages. And since it's not a, a structural 
uh, feature that's kind of going across the study area, they tend to have less environmental impacts and so therefore less mitigation. Um, and the different types of structural measures that we're considering are elevating residential structures, flood proofing, non-residential structures, uh, relocating on a voluntary basis, uh, localized uh, storm surge reduction measures around like warehouses, so that might be like a local, like a uh, small levy or something around there. Um, a wet proofing or dry proofing. Um, uh, and then one specific non-structural measure I just wanted to call out is we're looking at a potential uh, wave and storm surge barriers just off the coast. And the purpose of those wave and storm barriers would be to reduce the water height and velocities, which can be quite high in this area. Storm surge or waves in this area are known to get four feet high. Um, so this is kind of just a, a picture of where those have been implemented. This is in a low water year. Um, so they're exposed, but typically they're just covered with water. Um, and they're uh, generally constructed with a, uh, oyster uh, shells. And so they provide a little bit of that environmental benefit. Um, and they essentially act as essentially a speed bump. Um, so we're talking, uh, we're still considering putting these in close to the coast. Another measure that we're looking at is potential ring levies around critical infrastructure. So what we looked at, our economists help us look at where are those, um, the, the, the uh, map here shows expected annual damages, and this is based on past damages from uh, FEMA. And so we looked at where are those reoccurring damages happening within the study area, and if we can't justify a comprehensive levy system, where can we go and where those impacts are really focused and potentially can build a ring levy around those. And so right here, you can see just trying to capture th three different like alignments essentially here, trying to capture as many uh, economic damages. And this is all on the western side here where you're seeing the more uh, orange and yellow spots where they're showing higher economic damages. Other features that we considered, but we s screened out at this point, uh, we looked at Marsh Island closure. So there was suggestion at actually in our November public meeting that potentially putting in a closure structure right here uh, to prevent uh, waves coming in this way. Um, and then also looking at wave, wave attenuation structures similar to those uh, oyster reef barriers, those speed bumps and put them out here what, next to Marsh Island. Um, we looked into this outlet structure. Uh, this is very deep here, 60, 70 feet in depth. So that would be a very expensive alternative or very expensive feature. And the wind fetch or uh, the energy from wind could really pick up still across this bay. Uh, and it has enough area that it can pick those that wave uh, energy back up and then uh, still hit the coast. So the features out here were not considered to be effective. So those, those were screened. The other thing that we heard in the November public meeting was restoration of a couple of keys. Uh, down in the uh, south here was specifically rabbit and duck key were mentioned. Those both sat out uh, pretty far in the... Um, in the bay here, and we essentially had the uh, same rationale for screening. They're too far out in, in the bay that wave energy would be able to pick up again after those keys and, and have the same amount of power once it hit the coast. And then the last feature that we considered um, but screened out was a freshwater sedimentation project. Um, this one was something that the Corps had previously studied and was suggested during our November public meetings. It's largely, there's not a lot of reoccurring economic damages that are happening in that area, and it's uh, largely a ecosystem restoration uh, project, uh, so we weren't able to consider it for this project. So right now, our uh, initial way of alternatives is essentially trying to justify the structural comprehensive levy. So that could be either one of those alternative alignments that go across the entire project area. It could be looking at just a non-structural only, so the, the flood proofing, elevating, um, relocation, 
non-structural element. It could be alternative three where we try to protect existing critical infrastructure and, and or the existing levee raises and providing moving those riverine uh, levees up to the hurricane protection. Alternative four would be a combination of if we can justify the whole comprehensive levee um, and the non-structural. We have the opportunity to look at both together and we certainly will do that. Um, Alternative five is a combination of two and three, where if we can't justify the full comprehensive levy, we look at non-structural and then also look at where those economic damages uh, primarily occurring within the three parishes and can we focus in on those. And then as required uh, oop, per law, we have the no action alternative. So again tonight, I really wanna just emphasize we're we're looking for feedback and input on those uh, additional features that we could should consider, additional alternatives that we should consider. Um, after we assess the public input that we get over the tonight and tomorrow night, um, over the next few months, we're going to be kind of working towards finalization of those alternatives. And then, like this fall, we'll be evaluating and comparing those alternatives. And in December, we'll be coming back out with a recommended plan. All right, and next up is Mr. Joe Jordan. He's gonna talk a little bit about the um, natural resources within the project area. This is the, the go button here. Like Carla said, uh, I'm the environmental, uh, the birds and bunny guy on the project. And I've got several roles on this project. One, I have to gather uh, baseline information in the study area because some of these alternatives might have some impacts on some of our natural resources and some of our uh, social and economic uh, resources. So I'm, I'm looking at trying to uh, assess what is in the study area. And I wanna go through these real quick just so our folks on Facebook uh, can hear what they are. Uh, we're looking at wetland, coastal zone impacts, bottomland hardwoods, cultural resources, fisheries, wildlife, essential fish habitat, hazardous and toxic waste, water quality, air quality, threatened and endangered species. And then on the human side, uh, we're possibly, we're looking at uh, construction noise, uh, recreation impacts, hydrology and stormwater runoff, social economics and recreation. And the one I really kind of want to emphasize in this whole slide is the socio and economic impacts. Uh, we've got a lot of data studies on the birds and bunnies, but we're, we're looking for those, those types of impacts that might impact, let's say, uh, routes for emergency vehicles, routes to hospitals, uh, impacts to uh, schools, uh, impacts to uh, uh, communities and neighborhoods. We don't want to separate neighborhoods and communities like that. So those are the, some of the things that we're trying to get our hands around for the study. And I know uh, uh, Carla mentioned in one of her side slides that environmental laws were the top constraint for the project. And so I've got I've to work through those environmental laws. And uh, National Envi Environmental Policy Act that Carrie mentioned is one of those. And that's the law that says thou shalt assess the environment on an equal footing as far as economics and uh, those types of things. So we're, we're trying to embrace that. Another thing that NEPA asks for is public input. It requires the federal agencies to solicit your input. You know, and a lot of people say, well, you guys are just checking the box. And that's far from the truth. We really need your input on our alternative analysis uh, environmental impacts, social, social impacts, the whole gamut for this study. Uh, and so we really encourage you to fill out those cards, whether it's here or uh, when you get home, fill it in the mail and uh, get it to us. Uh, again, earlier the notice of intent is uh, supposed to end, the public comment is supposed to end uh, this Friday, May 17th, but we're waiving that because Three days is not uh, enough time to get comments. So anyway, uh, 
Oh, I'm sorry. I guess I should be on the microphone, shouldn't I? <laughs> they can't hear me in the back. I'm sorry. Uh, so if, if you've got comments early, uh, we have more time to evaluate those. But by all means, if you uh, have comments later in the process, something that comes to mind or you see, uh, please, you can provide that to us. And again, some of those environmental, those statutory environmental concerns we have uh, are endangered species. We're working with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, right now. They've provided us a list of those species potentially in the study area. Uh, essential fish habitat, we're working with NOAA on assessing uh, that uh, resource. And then we're looking at also with them uh, commercial fisheries. We've reached out to uh, the state SHPO and the tribes already. And we've also started our recreation analysis. And of course, we'll be looking at uh, water quality and assessing impacts to wetlands, whether it's a footprint of a levee or a alteration of a hydrology. Those are some of the things that we're going to be looking at. And I think I'm going to turn it over to Matt now, and he's going to go over what uh, some of the logistics of the process. So. These are some of the uh, types of questions that uh, the, the team is looking for tonight. Uh, we do have boards set up over there that were kind of uh, people were gathered around earlier. And then the big feature we have is the map on the table uh, for sticky notes. If you know of areas that flood or anything like that, your property or anything, uh, please leave a note on the uh, on a sticky note and put it on the map so we know that's an area with, that we need to go and look at. As everybody has said, we've got the cards at the sign-in table and at the map table. Take them with you, fill them out, take them to your friends. And if you really liked what you heard tonight, we'll be in Morgan City tomorrow uh, covering the topic again. So uh, please join us out there tomorrow if you really want to hear it again. Or, But more importantly, let your uh, friends, families, neighbors know who weren't able to be here tonight that we will be out in Morgan City tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. So these are ways to get in touch with us. they got the email address there at the bottom. Uh, if you want to write us. That's good too. There's the, all the information about the studies available on the website there. Uh, you can submit comments to us um, through there, through the, the card, or through um, Facebook. We are live streaming tonight, so if you leave a comment on there, uh, I'll make sure it gets to the PDT study team. But with that, uh, that will conclude the formal presentation, and uh, we'll go back. Um, please talk to the team about uh, information you have thoughts and ideas now that you've kind of heard the formal presentation part of this. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight.